Today we're having a Ward 5 meeting. For those of you who don't know, we've had previous meetings in uh, three of our other wards. The purpose of this is to educate uh, our ward members specifically on public safety in the ward. Um, I'm joined by Council Member Hanzak, who will say a few words shortly. Uh, but before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge the staff that are in the, in the room with me. Um, in the back of the room, I have uh, Captain Richard Sipperly, who is our commander of our support operations section. Um, I also have uh, Gigi uh, Saavedra, our crime analyst, or excuse me, our, I always get this wrong, our victim witness coordinator. Uh, we also have Lieutenant uh, J.B. Butler, who is our investigative commander. Uh, just standing in the room, Lieutenant Williams, who's our patrol commander. Uh, we have our Deputy Chief, Shabu Filipos. Um, we also have Ron Hardy, who's our emergency preparedness manager. Kathy Plevy, who's our PIO, as well as my administrative assistant. And last but not least, we have our newly promoted crime analyst, Misha Rowe. Okay. Um, also joining us from uh, the Park Police is Commander uh, Chuck Smith, and also joining us from the County Police, uh, how timely, uh, Commander <laughs> uh, McBain from the County Police. So the structure tonight is, is what we're going to do is we're going to give uh, an overview of crime stats within uh, Ward 5. Uh, we are going to then uh, have our partners, our allied uh, partners here, give an overview of of uh, crime going on in their area, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So before we get started, I'm gonna turn it over to Council Member Hanzak to say a few words. Good evening, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here with all of you. This is one of the first large meetings that we've had as a community since I have joined the council. And I just wanna say thank you, a huge thank you to um, Chief Duvall and also to the entire uh, Tacoma Park Police Department, but also to our county, County Police and our Parks Police, I am incredibly grateful on behalf of the neighborhood for you guys coming out because we are uh, one of the neighborhoods that stretches right out into those two jurisdictions. And these issues, people have told me, really matter a lot to us. And we are anxious to be able to talk about some cross-jurisdictional issues uh, that affect our part of the neighborhood. So um, I'm not gonna spend much time chatting. Uh, I am here to facilitate, to listen, and uh, I really want everybody to have as much time as possible to directly ask questions at the end of the presentation of our uh, different police departments, and I will be taking a lot of notes. I, we will also have a recording of this for those who aren't able to be with us tonight. I am gonna share with all of our police department we have about 30% of our population that is Hispanic, and most of them, or many of them, don't speak English comfortably. Uh, I struggled a little bit with how to advertise in that part of the neighborhood. I think it's something we can work on collectively for the future. I suggested they bring their teenage uh, children to translate for them tonight and listen, especially if their English was so-so and they could watch the presentation. I explained we had a visual. Uh, and then I said that I would do my best uh, to, to help out if they wanted to try to ask questions at the end. My Spanish is not terrific to do that. I find translation to be, you know, it's really nuanced, uh, but I will at least, you know, record it and try to get back to those residents if necessary. Um, I think we also have um, Amharic speakers, uh, quite a number of them in our particular ward, um, and I am not able to facilitate that directly. But uh, again, some things just to keep in mind because those are a lot of our residents in our ward. Um, and uh, let me just tell those, are, are the county police and the parks police, I know you work our neighborhoods too, but what I have noted is really unique about our neighborhood is we kind of stick out like a tower at the top of our uh, city, and we're also one of the poorest wards. I've, uh, I've said many times it's one of the most diverse places I've ever been on the planet, and I do international work for a living for the last 20 years. That's saying a lot. We have an incredibly diverse immigrant community in our particular piece of neighborhood. And so there's just a lot of different ideas and notions about public safety and policing that are coming together and converging. And it's really tough to figure out, you know, I, I literally hear two sides of what people want that are, you know, not the same. And, uh, and so it's, it's hard to navigate. I hope that you'll hear some of those tough questions and issues tonight and we can talk as a community later a little bit more and dig in about what we want to do about them as a community. Um, but I think it's important that people can talk to you directly. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we get into the presentation, I want to acknowledge a few people. We have uh, Mayor Searcy who has joined us. Uh, we also have Councilmember Fulcher from Ward 1 who has joined us, 
And our acting deputy city manager slash city manager, David Eubanks, is in the back as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our crime analyst, Misha Rowe, to give an overview of crime specifically in Ward 5. So um, today we're going to start uh, broad and then get more focused. So we're going to start with an overview of crime in the entire city of Tacoma Park through uh, 2022 um, and comparatively in past years. Um, and then kind of zone in onto Ward 5 and then go a little even more focused on some of the hotspot locations, specifically in Ward 5 where there are high numbers of crime incidents. Um, and then lastly, we'll also focus, focus on some of the shots fired incidents that have occurred in Ward 5 um, over the past year or two um, and what's being done to address that. So to start out, this is a chart comparing the entire city of Tacoma Park, the, the total amount of crime that happened in 2021 uh, compared to the total amount of crime that happened in 2022. This is for the entire city of Tacoma Park. Um, and so to go into this overview, um, there was a 23% increase in total Part 1 crimes from 2021 to 2022 throughout the entire city of Tacoma Park. Um, and to clarify, when I say Part 1 crimes, these are the types of crimes that we analyze in crime analysis. This includes homicide, rape, assault, robbery, burglary, larceny, theft from auto, and motor vehicle theft specifically. Um, so there were 580 total Part 1 crimes in 2021 and 716 total Part 1 crimes in 2022, leading to that 23% increase. Um, so Part 1 crimes that saw a decrease from 2021 to 2022, um, there was homicide, rape, robbery, and thefts from auto all saw a decrease from 2021 to 2022. And this is the entire city of Tacoma Park again. Um, and crimes that saw an increase uh, from 2021 to 2022 were assault, burglary, larceny, and motor vehicle theft. Um, and you're going to see some um, kind of scary looking numbers and percentages up there, such as like a 243% increase. Um, do not be alarmed at that number. That means it's it, because we're dealing with very relatively small numbers comparatively in the realm of an analytics and percentages. So like with homicide, there are some wards that had a one to zero change. That's a 100% change, and that seems like a lot percentage-wise, but number-wise, it's not a lot. So that's something to just be aware of. Um, focusing in on some of the wards, um, Ward 6 was in the majority with 43% of the crime that occurred in Tacoma Park in 2022. Uh, wards that saw decreases from 2021 to 2022 were Ward 1, Ward 4 and Ward 5 saw a decrease. Um, and wards that saw an increase in 2022 were Ward 2, Ward 3, and Ward 6. Um, and this is a chart um, showing the um, ward comparison in comparison to the entire city of Tacoma Park um, of how much crime was accounted for uh, comparatively to the entire city in the year of 2022. So um, as you can see in this chart, Ward 5 accounted for 4% of the crime in the city of Tacoma Park in 2022. That is the smallest percentage, so that is very good. So be proud of that. That is good stuff. Um, and um, going into the ward comparisons for 2021 to 2022, Ward 1 saw a 20% decrease. Ward 2 saw a 113% increase. Ward 3 saw a 20% increase. Ward 4 saw a 2% decrease. Ward 5 saw a 24% decrease. And Ward 6 saw a 21% increase. And once again, um, the entire city saw an increase in 23% in crime. So uh, focusing in a little uh, more onto Ward 5, these are the numbers um, of crime incidents that happened in 2021 and versus 2022 and the change for each uh, part one crime that we analyze. Um, so a homicide saw a decrease, uh, rape stayed the same, robbery saw an increase from one to four, assault saw an increase from two to three, burglary stayed the same, larceny saw a decrease, theft from auto saw a decrease, and motor vehicle theft saw a decrease. 
um, showing a 24% decrease in crime in Ward 5 from 2021 to 2022. Um, and this focuses a little more on the Ward 5 crime statistics uh, dictating how many Part 1 crime incidents occurred each month um, in the year of 2022. Um, and then this is also uh, just uh, portraying what percentage of crime of each type of Part 1 crime um, Ward 5 contributed to the entire City of Tacoma Park um, crime statistics for 2022. And again, the total number was 4% of crime. So focusing in uh, even more, these are the top five repeated or hotspot locations that were in ward, that occurred in Ward 5 um, in the year of 2022. These are the locations that saw the um, most crime incidents and the most reports and the most calls for service. Um, so first up was on the 7700 block of Maple Avenue. Um, specifically, the Essex House Apartments saw 12, uh, 12 reports in 2022. Um, next was the 7600 block of Flower Avenue, specifically Washington Adventist University saw five reports. The 600 block of Houston Avenue, which was Houston apartment, saw five reports. Um, the 8500 block of Piney Branch Road, uh, the Tacoma Park laundromat saw three reports, and the 8400 block of Flower Avenue, the Flower Avenue condominium, saw three. And then this dictates the um, crime incidents and reports that were responded to uh, for each of these um, focused hotspot locations. Um, so then lastly, getting into the shots fired incidents that have been occurring in the past few months, um, the, um, specifically in Ward 3 and specifically in Ward 5. Um, so this is an overview of the shots fired incidents that have occurred over time since 2021 when we first started to see them occurring um, in this way um, up to the present day. Um, so we definitely saw a spike this last month in February. Uh, but so far this month in March, that number has stayed relatively low, which is very good. Um, and this visual just displays um, the shots fired incidents that have occurred from 2021 to the present by Ward. Um, and as you can see, Ward 3 and Ward 5 make up the vast majority of these shots fired incidents. Um, and then focusing in a little more, these are some statistics analyzing um, when we see the most um, common occurrences of these shots fired incidents. Um, so Friday and Saturday um, saw the highest numbers of these shots fired incidents um, over, um, over these past few months and years since 2021. Um, and this is just dictating the percentage of how many incidents occur per each day of the week. Um, and then going over the time of day that most of these incidents occur, the vast majority of them occurred um, within the hour of 9 to 10 p.m. And then um, this is just uh, hopefully a helpful visual of mapping out where each location of each shot, shots fired incidents has occurred since 2021 up to the present day. So there's a cluster of them down in Ward 3 and a significant cluster of them up in Ward 5. And then zoning in on Ward 5, these are some of the locations where these shots fired incidents have occurred. That's the end of my presentation. Um, do we want to keep going or any other any questions right off the bat? We'll, we'll move on from here. I just okay. to touch on a little bit more. So, so what, uh, what Ms. Rose showed you was an overview of crime, not only in Ward 5, but also throughout the city. I think it's important to understand what we do with that information. Uh, one thing she, that she showed were heat maps that showed where significant incidents are happening and when they occur. So what we've done across the city and specifically in Ward 5 is we've allocated overtime details to those hotspot areas. So you probably noticed an increase in, in our active patrols. Uh, mostly what you'll notice is our uniform patrols around the shots fired calls. That's purposeful. That is so people know we're there to deter crime. What we've also done is we've allocated undercover resources as well. So across the city, um, we may not be necessarily be seeing it in Ward 5, but we're seeing it across the city. Uh, we are very aware of that, and we're using this data to put our officers in locations where crimes are occurring. Uh, our staff have made some significant arrests recently, and you may have seen that if you follow some of our social media. 
Uh, recently, in conjunction with the county police, we made an arrest for an individual that was responsible for multiple um, uh, food truck robberies. Uh, we also just made a, an arrest of a juvenile for a stolen vehicle not too long ago. Uh, we made arrests for individuals responsible for multiple burglary rings and so on and so forth. So um, we are out here actively investigating cases and, and kudos to our detective who have made significant arrests in 2022. Uh, for those of you who are interested, I will be presenting the police department annual report to the city council on March 22nd where we will go in depth about those arrests and much more broad overview of crime in the city in general, other accomplishments, not just necessarily arrest, but, but the community outreach and so on and so forth. So before we get into the Q&A, do we have a mic that we can bring up for the commander? Can you bring that one up? Because I want to give an opportunity, Commander McBain and uh, Lieutenant uh, Chuck Smith, to just give an overview of their area of responsibility. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Keep uh, it two to three inches from your mouth. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the opportunity to um, come and speak to you guys. Um, so I've been the commander, I'm, my, my name is Dave McBain, I've been the commander of uh, the third district, Silver Spring, for the last two years. Um, and uh, instead of going, hitting you with a lot of uh, the data, which is great, I just sometimes, um, uh, when, I'm, when I'm talking about crime, I, I try to talk about what's important, what's on your mind, what's, uh, what, what are we looking at, and, and how does it relate Dave, to... that one's not working. All right. Since we, excuse me, since we have a lot of people online, if you wouldn't okay, mind no repeating problem. that, if, sorry. Yeah, so, nice. um, so I'm, the, I'm the, uh, the third district commander. I've been around here for about two years now. Um, and uh, instead of talking about, uh, you know, the data, because you made a good point about when, when you have low numbers sometimes, like we have a 340% uh, rise in uh, auto thefts. And although there's significant rises in the county, um, it, it, the numbers kind of, uh, play around with you a little bit um, and when you see a big number like that jump up. Uh, but what I'd rather do is just talk about a few things that uh, that's probably important to you guys down here in Tacoma Park as it relates to uh, the third district and specifically uh, downtown Silver Spring, which I'm sure a lot of you might even uh, uh, come to Silver Spring to uh, hang out and uh, dine and, and maybe even work there. So. Uh, probably let's just go right down the line and most importantly uh, we've had three homicides this year um, I'll say that uh, last year uh, I made it to November before I saw a, a single homicide and then I, I really had a bad at the end of the year uh, but starting out uh, this year uh, we've had three homicides what's interesting about these three homicides and I can't really speak a lot of, of detail about them but uh, I, I will tell you that um, I, I think it's important that uh, people understand that um, these were um, these were incidents where individuals were meeting one another. This was not a random act of violence where uh, somebody was out and about in Silver Spring and and uh, randomly attacked. Uh, all the homicides, without going in depth, were were planned meetings between the individuals that um, uh, that um, you know ultimately lost their lives, and so. Um, I just think that's important for people to understand, um, you know, the circumstances behind some of these homicides. Uh, when we're talking about robberies, uh, specifically for downtown Silver Spring, uh, the, um, the, the, the problem that we've been having is uh, carjackings. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about carjackings as it relates to, um, you know, the vehicle itself, theft, you know, theft of the vehicle, but also the carjackings. Uh, a lot of the instances that we're having and that we're seeing downtown are a result of uh, cars being left unattended but running. Uh, we have individuals that hang out in downtown Silver Spring. Uh, they prey on individuals that leave their cars running, and when the individuals walk back to their car to jump in, uh, they are met usually by someone trying to take over the vehicle. Uh, and uh, in most cases, there's some type of struggle that goes on and the car is taken, which kind of constitutes or it, it meets the definition of a carjacking. Uh, we're, we're having the same problem with auto thefts, uh, specifically with uh, food uh, deliveries like the Uber Eats guys uh, and gals. Um, they're, they're leaving their cars running on George Avenue and all points in between. Uh, and what happens is uh, w once they go inside the restaurant, I'm telling you, these, there's some young individuals that are just waiting uh, and they're just watching people. And when they see an unattended motor vehicle, uh, they will take it. And so that's been... Uh, really my challenge to kind of get out into the public about uh, what you can do to help yourself 
uh, but as it relates to carjackings and to, uh, to auto thefts, um, you know, those are w what I think is the root cause of a lot of our problems. Um, uh, to combat the carjackings, uh, I saw a significant rise down on uh, Thayer Avenue um, and uh, around the Safeway and the parking garages down there. Um, and so this year, end of last year, going into this year, we, uh, we invested heavily in uh, camera systems in downtown Silver Spring. Um, I can use them anywhere in the district, but I tend to use them downtown. But these are mobile camera systems that we use. They're, they're a good deterrent. Um, and then also they help us with um, going back and, uh, and, and, and getting evidence that we need for some crimes that occur. But we can also live view them. So we use them in, uh, uh, in a way to um, uh, kind of keep an eye on, on the area and everything suspicious that comes about. Uh, we, we now have a crime center that we're operating 24 hours a day, uh, and we, we use uh, the, the camera technology to thwart crime or to uh, actually get there a little quicker uh, and also to follow up on, on crimes that have occurred. Uh, we can go back and get a lot of information that's helped lead to a lot of arrests. Um, and, um, and really, the, uh, uh, probably the, my biggest challenge over the last couple of years has been the nightlife in downtown Silver Spring. <laughs> Uh, Montgomery County, uh, the county executive has uh, introduced a, a bill uh, to um, basically to uh, put restrictions or, or to, to give guidance to establishments that want to stay open all night long. Uh, we have a lot of hookah bars. We have a lot of uh, different uh, restaurants that uh, stay open all night long. And as a result, uh, you know, these, these restaurants, uh, when they start experiencing problems, those problems dump out onto George Avenue or out onto the streets of Silver Spring, and my officers are having to, to kind of uh, go down and calm things down, and, and we, uh, we do make a number of arrests as a result. Um, but the, um, th this, this bill uh, is going to uh, have businesses like Society Lounge and Eva Lounge and some others uh, come up with uh, security plans uh, it's, it, I think it's, it's, a good, it's a good bill. Uh, I, I wanted it to be a little bit uh, stronger. I think others did as well. But uh, for what it does, uh, it, it does, it does help us uh, because it had, all, all these businesses have security plans. Uh, they have to have clear windows so that we can see what's inside the businesses for us to, when we're responding to these calls, it makes things safer for us. And then for those who are constant violators of uh, of the, you know, the security po policy or if there's constant problems at a restaurant uh, or, or an establishment stays open, the county is going to have the um, authority to shut it down uh, or you know, rescind uh, permits to uh, sell alcohol uh, and, and to stay open uh, overnight. So we'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes uh, once we implement that program uh, to see if it, it really does help us out. Um, and then um, uh, Chief Duvall had said, uh, you know, he has uh, overtime details to address, you know, uh, certain spikes in crime. Um, Silver Spring, I, I have a significant amount of, uh, of overtime details that I run into, in downtown Silver Spring specifically. Um, what I recognized was uh, I, I was really having to hyper-focus on the overnight hours in Silver Spring, um, and they seem to have calmed down a little bit. We've, we've done a lot of... Uh, uh, establishment checks, and we've worked with uh, the Department of Alcohol Beverage Services and and the uh, the state of Maryland for um, some of the violations that we see overnight. Uh, but um, because it's kind of calmed in the overnight hour hours, um, I've been able to kind of reallocate my resources of overtime for uh, a 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. walking detail, where I have three officers that actually walk in certain parts of downtown Silver Spring. Um, I've found that that's been so effective uh, during the times when people are, are using downtown Silver Spring. Um, it's been so effective that I'm going to start another uh, detail from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, again, walking beats downtown. It's been a long time since we've really invested a lot of time in, into these walking beats. Uh, it does take a, a, an officer out of the cruiser, but it does get them on the street in the community, and we've had a lot of success. Um, and we're going to continue with those efforts. Um, and uh, I know I, 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 I focus basically on downtown Silver Spring. I think it's what affects you guys most uh, as far as you know, being part of uh, um, you know, the Silver Spring area uh, in Tacoma Park. Uh, and I'm sure that there'll be some questions that I can answer later. Uh, but um, 
all in all, I think uh, that's a rundown of what's kind of important going on right now. Appreciate it. And both Commander McVeigh and Commander Smith will be here to answer questions at the end. We'll turn it over to uh, Commander uh, Chuck might, Smith might from I, the Park Police. Sorry, I, just because you, you said that might be the area of most interest and you may not have this at the top of mind. Um, so the northern tip of our ward is yep. up in the Long Branch area at yep. the junction of Piney Branch and Flower. Yep. And I'm, I'm very sure that many people have a lot of thoughts about that. If you have any quick thoughts on yep. that, and then we can take questions later. But if you just want to sure. share a few thoughts on that. Real thank quick you. thoughts uh, um, for, for Long Branch, um, uh, we've invested a significant amount of resources to deal with. Um, we have a lot of homeless individuals that are at the library and at the uh, rec center. Uh, we've been working with them with Pathways DC and uh, uh, Bethesda Cares, believe it or not. Um, and really, it's been an, it, our effort has been uh, to um, they were they were really affecting the businesses at Flower and Piney Branch, and we, we've really worked with them to kind of, you know, we recognize that they're on the street, but we're working with them and trying to offer them some assistance, uh, other county assistance to um, get them, you know, from not using the restroom on the sidewalks and things like that. So um, that's been pretty effective. Um, as far as uh, as far as crimes concerned, um, I tell you, if if you if you own a Hyundai or a Kia, um, I, I encourage you guys to, um, I believe that you can go online and there's, I, I think those comp the company or the car dealer is offering some, um, some uh, I, I, I guess it's a, a locking club. steer, a club. Club, um, club device. But I can tell you that, uh, key, that these two cars are 60% of our auto thefts in Silver Spring. Um, and uh, that's a pretty significant number. So. Um, uh, and we're seeing that same uh, trend down in uh, in the Piney Branch, Long Branch area, as well as catalytic converters and uh, and other auto parts. We've seen a lot of Hondas uh, where they're completely removing the uh, the tires uh, overnight hours, and uh, and then ultimately uh, in that region, uh, uh, believe it or not, like one of the hot button topics for us is parking, uh, and so we have a lot of parking issues that result in fights and and uh, different things that, that occur just for parking spots down in that, that region of the county. Um, so um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over and uh, answer questions when, you, when we're all done here. Thank you. Appreciate the presentation. Thanks, Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Chuck Smith. I'm a lieutenant with Maryland Park Police. I'm currently a shift commander, which means I supervise patrol units. I'm also in charge of our special operations section currently. I wanted to share with you some information that I gathered today so that would be current and up to date with everything. Just so you know, we have about 24 parks and trails that are within Tacoma Park or adjacent to Tacoma Park that we service. And I want to give you a rundown of what we did last year and then I'll bring you up to date for this year. <clears throat> Excuse me, over the past 12 months, there has been a documented park, poli documented park police presence 1,805 times during the time frame, and this is in 2022. There were 63 reports uh, written, 28 involved vandalisms, seven was trash dumping, two was larceny, uh, two incidents of um, indecent exposure or indecent conduct, two incidents of controlled danger and substance use, drug use, uh, two aggravated assaults, one recovered stolen vehicle, and one robbery. The remaining reports were written for non-criminal events, such as property uh, damage collisions, unintentional property damage, and evaluating someone from, for psychological reasons and taking them into the hospital. In terms of frequency of crime, over a 12-month period, the most calls for service were dispatched to the following, Tacoma, Piney Branch Local, one of our parks, New Hampshire Estates, Long Branch Trail Number 1, and the Sligo Creek Parkway trails. Year to date, park police officers have visited already these, these trails that surround and parks that surround the Tacoma Park area 48, uh, 484 times already this year. We have written 19 reports in parks with a Tacoma Park address. In 2023, most of our report calls have been dispatched to Tacoma Piney Branch Local, Long Branch Trail Number One again where we handled calls for drug violations, vandalism, and a robbery. Uh, I would, uh, so there's just a breakdown just in 2022 
and also some of the uh, recent stats for 2023. Um, in terms of, I wanted to say this because this is so important to, to me and I know to Chief Duvall and to Montgomery County Police, these meetings, these community meetings we have is just price, I'm sorry. The community meetings, community meetings we have with you folks are just priceless because if you don't establish that relationship with folks in the community, we can't be successful. And I can tell you right now, I know it's our mission, it's the Tacoma Park Police mission, Montgomery County's mission, it's the same. And honestly, that is to provide, you know, a safe community, a community with lower crime, and an overall better quality of life for everyone here. So in terms of how we partner to do that, is we do exchange information. We work hand in hand sometimes at some of these events. During National Night Out, uh, we'll get together the different agencies in different locations and some of other events that go out throughout the year. And uh, you know, we, we, again, exchange information. My chief uh, was an assistant chief with the Montgomery County Police, Chief Darrell McSwain. So he has a great relationship with Montgomery County Police. Uh, chief Duvall and Assistant Chief Philip Post were both former Park Police commanders and uh, Chief Duvall was the chief there. So we do work hand in hand. We exchange information through emails, through statistics, and we're always happy to get involved uh, with anything they have going on their area. You're gonna see the park police, again, in these parks that I mentioned. They may not be within the, the limits or the city limits of Tacoma Park, but you'll see them and, and they're actively patrolling. We also um, offer overtime. When we're short staffed, we make sure staffing is adequate, so we offer overtime and we have certain overtime programs that we run as well. So um, I'll be happy to answer questions later, but thank you for having me here. I, I really appreciate it and I hope to be back to see you again. Thank you. Uh, at this point, Ron, do we wanna, uh, I just wanna echo what uh, both commanders have said. Uh, we work together intimately on all of these. We exchange real-time information, but we also know each other. Uh, we're kind of one big family in law enforcement here. so. Uh, understand that uh, that we're all working uh, together to keep you all safe. So what we're going to do now is we're going to open up to questions. We did not receive any questions in advance on email, but what we're going to do is we're going to rotate back and forth between uh, questions on Zoom, questions from participants here, and uh, Councilmember Hanzak also has some questions that she wants to answer. So we'll start out with some questions in the audience. Just raise your hand and Ron will bring you the mic if you want to ask a question. I was going to say, I've never... Just a pause. I, I, Just a quiet. Just remember to keep it about two to three inches from your face so that they can hear you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Ruben Snipper, former council member here in uh, Ward 5, higher. actually. A little higher? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I really appreciate your doing this uh, community meeting with uh, not just Tacoma Park Police, but the police in the surrounding areas, because I know that one of the issues in any organization, like, like Tacoma Park, the <laughs> Parks Police, the you know, Silver Spring, is coordination. And I was really glad to hear that you have both informal and uh, formal methods of uh, collaboration. I wonder if you would uh, lay out in a little more detail uh, what that is exactly. That's a really good question. So, so, and, and sure. So, so, um, it was from Ruben Sniper, a former council member in, here in the city. Um, he asked uh, he, to elaborate. He was thankful that we had both the county police and park police here to join us. Um, and he asked if I could elaborate on the relationships, both informal and formal, between those agencies. So, I, I think that the, the fact that you stressed informal and formal. So, I'll touch on formal first. Um, our crime analysts share real-time crime information on a daily basis, not only with the county police and park police, but the regional police. So when we have incidents, so earlier today, uh, we had a burglary of a residence that was occupied. That information will go out in real time to our partners at the park police, county police, Prince George's County Police, and all of our allied agencies. So that happens. We also share uh, investigative data. So we have our investigative commander in the back, uh, Lieutenant Butler. Uh, when we uh, gathered a, 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 a suspect in the, the food truck burglaries, or excuse me, robberies, we worked directly with the county police. We identified a suspect in our robberies. They were able to charge that same suspect 
uh, with robberies in their jurisdiction. So that's an example of kind of the formal. Um, all of the chiefs on the various agencies known each other for the longest time. Uh, we have personal relationships and professional relationships. And that goes into the informal, not only on that level, but also on the commander level, the sergeant level, and also on the chief level. I think that's critical. So if Lieutenant Williams has an incident that overlaps into the third district, she'll know who to reach out to in the third district to address that. Um, I know a few people at the Park Police, just a few, um, so we have that relationship as well. So we're able to, uh, you know, Deputy Chief Filippos is able to reach out to their deputy chief and so on and so forth. I think that's really critical, but I want to stress, that's not something that just happens here in Tacoma Park. That is, I, I've been part of this, um, this uh, Montgomery County law enforcement network for, for almost 30 years. And that's something that's unique to this jurisdiction. And I think that's something that people that live in this county benefit from. And I think here, because, in, in the city in particular, we have the Tacoma Park Police. We are the full service primary agency here, but we also have the county police that comes in and assist us. We have the Park Police, as Lieutenant Smith mentioned earlier, have multiple areas within the city. But we also have Prince George's County that abuts us. We also have the Metro Transit Police. We also have all of these other agencies. So that's a critical component. Um, so I, I can't stress enough how critical that is for us being able to do our jobs and vice versa for them to be able to do theirs. Any other questions in the audience? We have one in the back, and then we'll come over. We'll go here, and then we'll go. Uh, then we'll go over to you. Thanks. My uh, this is a great meeting. Thanks for organizing it. Um, my name is Ann Fitzer, and I'm also a resident of Ward Five. And I was gratified. Here, let me take the mask off in case that helps. But I was gratified to see the crime statistics saying that Ward Five is is relatively lower. But then I also am cognizant of what Kara was saying about language abilities, and I'm wondering if we've ever done any surveys to find out if there's underreporting of crime in, in our ward. Thank you. Uh, that's a really good question. I, I think in general, crime is underreported. And we stress that it is this at every meeting we have. Please call us. Um, for those of, who are concerned about their immigration status, I say it everywhere we go. We're, in, we're a sanctuary city, same as Montgomery County Police, same as Park Police. We're not concerned about your immigration status. We want you to get the services that you deserve. So specifically, have we gone out and, and seen if, if crime is underreported in Ward 5 specifically? No, we have not done that specifically, but I will tell you that across the board, crime is probably underreported. Um, certain inc incidents, whether it be theft, whether it be assault, so on and so forth. And in our immigrant com community, uh, language barriers definitely are an yes, impediment. Yes. And I stress to, to all of our residents, especially Ward 5 residents, uh, we have, we, our officers speak seven different languages. Uh, we have multiple officers on every shift. At least, at least one person speaks Spanish on every one of our patrol shifts. We are very, very fortunate that our police department is a re almost a direct reflection of the demographics of this city. We are one of the few police departments that's almost fully staffed, and we are diverse. We speak Amharic, we speak Greek, we speak Spanish. Uh, we speak multiple, language, multiple languages. So we really, really, really uh, encourage people to feel comfortable reporting uh, crime to us. But, but to answer your question, yeah, I, I don't think that's unique to us. That's, that's, that's all jurisdictions. Cr crime is generally unreported. And, and it goes back to, to what I talked about earlier, and I talked about deployment of resources, and the county police talked about it as well. If we don't know that occurrences are happening, when we're, when we're allocating those resources ba based on the heat map, we're not going to know that there have been a number of, of car break-ins. And if you call us, someone may have rumpled through your car and taken a phone charger, and it may not be that significant. But if you report that, we come out, we may be able to get video evidence for a burglary that occurred by those same suspects. So not only is it critical for us to point our resources, but it also is critical for possibly catching other people or committing other crimes. If I, if I may, I just share a little anecdote sure. from um, just to get to your point. In the in the northern part of our ward, I did a lot of door to door um, going around, and I've done it again. I handed out uh, by hand about 200 flyers across our neighborhood over the last three days, really focusing on the central and northern part of the ward where people are harder to reach via you know our email updates and such. And I will say that you know, especially in the laundromat, I've had a number of really terrible stories told to me about people 
being the victims of crime and not reporting. So yes, it's, I mean, as the chief said, I think it's not just language, unfortunately, it's a, a, a culture of fear that has been formed over the last few years, especially acutely. Um, and it's our job now to help try to dismantle that under our current cultural regime and tell them about the special aspects of Tacoma Park and that we are a sanctuary city because not everybody knows that. Right, I was just saying, I think we have a question on, on the, we can go over here. I think she, she had her hand up raised in, then we'll come back over. <laughs> First, hi, Chief Duvall. Hi. Hi, Karen. How are uh, you? My name is Maxine Hillary. I'm the gadfly of Tacoma Park. Uh, I live uh, adjacent to 636 Houston uh, apartments. So when you said 600 block of Houston. Oh, really? Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? I, I think it's picking, it's, it's, it's picking up for the recording, Maxine. That's you why they're. Can I take my mask off? Yeah, if you, if you don't mind, if you feel comfortable with that. Well, not really, but okay. Anyway. Uh, I, I can repeat your I can repeat your question okay. if you want. Six three six. Um, I've lived on my property, which is the first. There's only four houses on that street. My property is the first house. Six three six Houston is was told to me over and over by every police officer, and I think every single one has been at that property. This is the worst property uh, to come apart. Well, you know, the reality of it is the people mostly who live there. Maybe they're not well healed, but they're just basically good people. You know. And I make it a point, I have three tribal police officers in my family who work out on a reservation and they see stuff. And I go, wow, I don't hear some of the stuff from them that I hear here. But I really do want to thank our police officers. I engage them every chance I get. And one of the things that I have heard from them numerous times is they, their morale isn't good. And I know some of it is, you know, there's things that happen in other places that really are just unacceptable, and we all know what they are. I don't have to give you a history lesson. But we're not Ferguson. You know, we're a little tiny town. We're two miles big with 20,000 people. And we, I've never seen any of our police officers act in a way, I mean, nobody likes to get a ticket, but I've not seen behaviors from them that I would say, wow. But I feel, you know, like we probably need to look at our officers with a, a, a little bit more gratitude and maybe kind of understand. I'm a graduate of the Montgomery County Citizen Police Academy. When all of the stuff started going down in 2015, I wanted to find out what his training looked like. So it was 15 weeks, it was really great. And I really learned a lot that I had never known before. All that said, 636 is, um, we got a landlord, doesn't turn his lights on. We have no street light. I have asked for three solid years to have the street light in the parking lot turned on. We have an abandoned car that's been there now for three days. And it's private property, but it's not a parking spot. It's an abandoned car, and we have to jockey around it to get out of the driveway. My house gets all of it first before anybody does. And I've been somewhat patient with things I don't want to talk about here. But I start to ask myself, when I've looked at my neighborhood, and it's been this way for a long time. When people got problems in the Houston Court or in those apartments, that sit, they come to my house. They dock at my door. And I ask myself, we talk in Tacoma Park, we're so progressive, but when do we do anything to help our kids? Because who's really the perpetrators of this? You know, a lot of times it's kids that really aren't getting good supervision or good resources. And kids, kids are kids, but kids that are not, interventions don't happen early, they just keep on going. So I want to know, what's the demographic? Who are the main perpetrators and why, instead of, you know, I'm, I'm big on vilifying people who do nasty mm -hmm. stuff, but I also come from a place of really troubled people and I see the trauma and all of the social systems and whatnot, and so I want to know, we're talking a lot about the relationships between the police, but what are we doing to prevent? Because, yeah, I see a car running outside of, you know, a restaurant. I'm not going to go get in and drive off. I know better than that. You know, I see an opportunity to commit a crime every day. I mean, I could probably shoplift giant every chance I get. I'm not going to do that. So I want to know what are we doing to, in addition to all of our community, but what are we doing 
to really prevent some of it. We can educate people, but ultimately it's like, well, if you left your car open, somebody broke in, you've almost made the victim at fault. You know, I will never leave my car open, but. <coughs> yeah, Maxine. Others, so I want to ask about that, and I want to know why we can't get, you know, Mr. Patner at 636 to manage his building. It's continually unlocked for years. It's got trash all over it. It's had fentanyl and heroin been dealt right across from my dining room window. Uh, Maxine, I, I appreciate all the questions, but I'm for sorry. the sake of time, I'm going to try to answer because there were like four questions in that. So I'm going to yeah, try to yeah, answer yeah. that and allow sorry. other people. So, so first of all, I, I, I do truly appreciate uh, your, your comments about our officers. Um, I, I say it all the time. We have a phenomenal workforce, but we really need to pay attention to them and reward them. We are very fortunate that people are not leaving our police department. We need to do everything we can to make sure that they stay here and we recruit the right people. Um, as far as, as, as our youth and preventing crime, I say it everywhere I go. We need to take a holistic re uh, view of what's going on here. Um, and it starts um, at what is the cause of crime, early childhood invention, education, jobs, et cetera. Everywhere I go, I talk about that. So that is a long-term solution because we have to start doing that because if we don't address the causes of crime, we're gonna be right back where we are in a cycle. Uh, those of you who have been in this area for a long time, think what you want about Marion Barry, the former mayor of the District of Columbia. His summer jobs uh, youth program did more for our youth and to prevent crime than any other program that was, that was implemented. Um, you know, some of our staff here uh, benefited from that program. So I, I think that, that when you talk about what are we doing for our youth, I think it's our responsibility um, as a city to offer programs for our youth, whether that's through the rec department, whether that's through the Montgomery County public school system. So I think that, that we're looking at doing that. There was a, a reimagining public safety task force that was put together here in the city. Um, they made a lot of recommendations about addressing some of the issues that you're talking about. A lot of the crime, a lot of the crime is being committed by juveniles. Um, and, and, and some of the, state, the, the laws in the state of Maryland have been lessened where we can't charge juveniles under a certain age with certain offenses. So that's problematic as well. Um, but it's not about just locking up kids. It's about d developing systems in a society where if you see the car that's running, you don't get in it and drive away. So I agree with you 100%. Um, it's something that we as police uh, completely understand. I think there's not a police officer in this room that would not advocate for those type of programs. Um, so we're, we're with you 100%. About the property in, in, in question, I understand we have some ongoing problems there. Um, I would encourage you to continue to work with our police department and, and our code enforcement section to address those concerns. Uh, after the meeting, I can have one of my commanders talk to you directly about what, what we need to do to address some of those concerns, but I do realize that it's an ongoing problem. So. I encourage you to reach out to your council members. May, may I? Th may three, I, three, may three I, of them are I, in the room. <laughs> so, let, me, let me turn it Could over I, to council yeah, member Yeah, if I may, because uh, a lot of those things are more, more in my domain a little bit to try to do something more directly about. Uh, and, we, and we can continue this conversation, too, further, and I, I, I hope we will after, uh, after this meeting and or uh, in a second forum that, where we won't necessarily have our officers with us. But just very quickly, I want to touch on several of your points. One, you said you're a graduate of the Citizen Police Academy. I am trying really hard to get the word out about that if you haven't heard about it. It's a fantastic program that I am hoping I can sign up for. I haven't done it yet, but everybody who's done it says it's terrific. Uh, and uh, and people get to ride in a patrol car. You can even be a 16-year-old and uh, sign up for the program. So I, I really am trying to get the word out and welcome you helping me do that. And we offer a, a Hispanic one. Oh, and, oh, and they offer one in Spanish, if you did not hear that. But um, lo ofrecen right. en español, si están, están escuchando. That's the, es Montgomery, un programa that's the Montgomery County Police. Para, we, we don't sí, offer that as a bit. Un programa eh, en cual puedes recibir educación sobre la policía y... y uh, oh, 
Are you telling me no, something? Okay, <laughs> thanks. You're good. All right, um, and we'll take more questions afterwards. Uh, and then you also touched on youth. Uh, I, this is close to my heart. Uh, I feel really strongly that a lot of the people in our ward I have discovered are not actually even aware that this city offers a lot of programming and scholarships. So um, a lot of people sitting in this room will be on my email updates. The people may be online or not necessarily, and people who aren't here. Uh, I made a paper newsletter for those folks, kind of a different target audience. You probably haven't even seen it. You weren't the, my target audience, some of you. Uh, and it has recreation opportunities. It spells out how to get a scholarship through the city and kind of what's the difference between the city and the county. So where do you go to get these things? Uh, and I will keep working at that. I, I feel really passionately about it. And again, we should talk about that more after. Management companies, uh, I have just started chasing them down. Uh, and I have a list given to me by the city. And my first order of business is to approach them in a positive way. Uh, so that we can maintain a good relationship, hopefully, and then I can make some hard plugs for things like, hey, those lights are never on, or whatever the case may be. Um, so I have asked them for a celebration uh, back behind where you are, Maxine. Uh, we're going to hold our first one, actually, I haven't announced yet, in early June, June 4th, back on Houston Court. Uh, and I've got Cheers on board and several others, and I'm looking to have uh, celebrations throughout the community in which we will also bring resource people. And if the police are interested in joining us, we would love to have you with us. There haven't been enough spaces in which uh, city resource people who want to help us have been able to come out and meet and greet our residents, and this is really important, I think. Uh, and uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think we'll take we'll take a couple more in the in the room, and then we will uh, go on to Zoom questions. So we'll take two more, and then we'll go to Zoom, and then we'll come back to the room. Mr. Sherman, go ahead. Uh, Wayne Sherwood from uh, Ward One. I'm in Grand Avenue. Can you hear this? Okay. Um, Thank you very much for coming here tonight. Uh, I particularly like uh, the plug that the chief gave to uh, summer youth employment programs. And uh, since the city is right now in the process of looking at its budget, both for uh, revisions in the current budget and for next year's budget, this is the time to uh, contact your city councilors. And uh, thank you very much for bringing that up. The other thing I wanted to, to speak to was uh, what uh, Officer Smith talked about, the park police, um, and he was talking about the Tacoma Piney Branch local park, which I think is right across the street from me. And I haven't had problems there myself personally, but the, the houses, the people in the houses right across the street from me, uh, their houses back up on that park, and they have had a lot of problems. And it's really hard to know uh, what to do and when to count, call the, uh, the parks police because like on a Friday night in the summer, there could be you know, a bunch of guys up there playing soccer in the early evening and that's a, a really good time. Uh, they might not have any other time to go. So you know, there's a sign up there and it says don't be up there after sunset or something like that. But they might be up there after sunset and they're obviously they're having a great time and nobody wants to call the police on them. And then sometimes that goes on a little later and people will be s sitting up at the park benches up at the top of the hill and it could be they're just having a family picnic or something like that. And, and maybe they don't really take it seriously, the sign that says don't you know, be up here after sunset. And then about you know, later on, at uh, 10 o'clock, there might be a, a, a bunch of people up there partying and, and they're ma starting to make a lot of noise. And so then the, the uh, people up there that live on those the houses across the street from me, they wonder, should we start calling? And, and a lot of times if they don't call, then uh, at 11 o'clock you'll start hearing shots fired. <laughs> and so the question is, you know, they can't call every half hour or every hour in that process. When is the best time for them to, to call? <laughs> Uh, if we can pass the mic up to Lieutenant Smith, I'll let him handle it. But as a former park police officer in, in chief, um, obviously err on, on what you think is is prudent. But but you know there gets to a certain point where where calling is 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 probably the best uh, best idea. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Smith, allow her to answer questions. 
I, I appreciate the, uh, the information. As the chief said earlier, we don't know if you don't call. My suggestion is if, if you see a problem up there or, or something that's going to be a potential problem, you call. We're coming. We all have heard the slogan, see something, say something. I think that's more paramount today than ever. So my recommendation is if you have any doubt, call. And thank you for letting us know. And I'll let the uh, officers who are assigned to that beat who work that area, I'll let them know about some of the things you said tonight. And uh, I'll take notes of it so we can already get, it, get ahead of it. But please call. When in doubt, call. And, and for those of you who are not aware, uh, the Park Police direct line is, you want to give it? So I, I, I still can remember <laughs> it, but I'll turn it over to you if you want. Yeah, <laughs> it's 301-949-8010. Uh, 301-949-8010 is the non-emergency line for the uh, Maryland National Capital Park Police Montgomery County Division. And you can Google it if you don't remember that. Uh, and you call, we're coming. And I'll send it out. Sure. Uh, I, I will give two numbers out. Um, so get your phone ready if you have your phone available. Uh, the Maryland National Capital Park Police Montgomery County Division number is 301-949-8010. 301-949-8010. They have their own dispatch system, so you will get their dispatcher that will dispatch directly to them. The Tacoma Park Police number is 301-270-1100. 301-270-1100. Two seven zero one one zero zero. You will get a Tacoma Park dispatcher. For those of you who are not aware, calls that come in through nine one one, we have our own dispatcher, but we are treated as a district through the Montgomery County Police Department. So what happens is a call taker will take the call at ECC, the Emergency Communication Center, and they will transfer it to our Tacoma Park dispatcher. That's the way it works throughout the county. In Commander McBain's district, a call taker in Gaithersburg now, I think that's where the dispatch center is, will take the call and then transfer it to the Silver Spring district. We have we are what's similar to our own district. So um, not to get off on, on that, but uh, I think everyone who got the numbers as I've repeated them like three or four times. So we will make sure that it's put out in, in uh, Council Member Hanzak's notes. And if you have any questions, you can always Google us and find us. So uh, with that, we'll take one more question in the audience, um, and then we'll go to, to Zoom. Just, let me and say real quick, too. Yep. My card is up here with my cell phone. I'm not going to put that out so that it goes out to everyone. But if you have an, ear, an issue with Park Police, I am the, the road commander. My cell phone's up here. Please call me and let me know personally. I, you want to go to yeah. – we'll go to the back of the room, and then we'll go. We'll put the council member on hold for a little bit. Well, well, we'll ask you here. Hello. Um, I'm Dewan Glenn. Um, I just moved here to Tacoma Park in April. So this is my first department. So excited, you know, to be independent and everything. Um, this more so goes to the safety as far as landlord. I think I live in a building with, um, I was called a slum lord. Um, with that being said, my apartment, the left side of it is condemned. Um, it was a fire. Apparently, it was an electrical fire. Um, the roof was already collapsing in my apartment and as well as the adjacent apartment. I live in a, a six-story um, apartment home. So the, um, I had to contact the county because my ceiling was collapsing and they weren't doing any work to my apartment. Um, you fast forward to two weeks later while they were coming, the roof collapsed in the apartment across, prompting the gentleman to have to move out. Um, during this time period, my carbon monoxide was going off, um, and the fire alarm was going off. Um, was was going off, and this was before the actual fire. So I w already was kind of, you know, worried. I mean, even going to sleep, like I would leave my window open because of the ventilation, and I didn't really know what to do um so now the entire left side of the building is condemned um and i don't know if i'm supposed to be in that building <laughs> like um even down to like i try to keep ventilation keep my windows open but it still smells like charcoal in the building so i'm not sure <laughs> if uh, you know if i should contact the county or tacoma park or 
or, you know, what that looks like moving forward. I, uh, yeah, for, yeah, your mayor's right next to you. Yeah, I, yeah she's giving also, you the card. For, also, first, yeah, first off, that you should not have to live under those conditions. Yeah. You, have, you have your council member to my right. You have the mayor right there. Um, you have the resources here in the city of Tacoma Park. That should not be happening, period. So before you leave the day, make sure you get the, your contact information to the mayor, to Council Member Hans Act, and to my staff, and we'll connect you with housing. That Those are not living conditions that anybody should have to live in. I don't know why they are that way. I'm familiar with the fire in question, uh, but that should not happen at all. But, uh, Council Member. You lost your mic. You really oh, lost your mic. That is why I don't have this mic. <laughs> um, so Dewan and I met. Uh, serendipitously as I was passing out my 200 flyers. Uh, and I said, oh, you're one of the people I didn't get to meet in the building that Chief Duvall told me had burned. And I walked out there maybe four or five hours after the fire happened because I didn't, I didn't receive, I didn't pick up my phone to see the call right away. And I met his uh, house building mate who was sitting in his car. And I, I, won't, I won't go on with this story, but the story is that you know, I had met two of the people in the building on that day and stayed there for maybe an hour and a half or so. I, I checked in, uh, have been checking in with the, the person who, who wasn't able to come back to the building, and he is now well housed. Our housing department, thank you very much, uh, stepped in when the management company didn't do what I had expected them to do for this resident. Um, but I didn't meet Dewan until I said, oh, you're from that building. And we met on the street and I said, I'm having this meeting, let's connect. Um, so I am so glad that you've come out and, and I hope that, that our housing department can follow up with you. Um, there is still smoke residue in the building, Dewan told me. And uh, it gives me a lot of concern uh, about how people are living. And one of the people in the building had their door knocked in by the, the fire department and I'm not sure that it's been fixed, right, Dewan? So, yeah, that's not okay. Uh, but this was all within the last seven, two weeks, yes, yeah, 10 days, about 10 days, had all of this has transpired. And Dewan and I, I'm glad we met. Yep. Yeah. All right, after uh, assaulting my mic here, we will uh, <laughs> we'll turn it over to, to questions on Zoom. And, and Kathy's just going to read the questions off, and then we'll answer them here. Um, um, OK. Um, the first one is, what is happening at the public storage? Do they have security? Um, are the police doing a survey of the facility? And have we given recommendations on how to improve security if they don't? Uh, that just, just for this meeting, that's Ward 6. That's not Ward 5. But I will answer the question specifically. I'd rather uh, answer specific questions to Ward 5. So if there are questions that are not specifically pertaining to Ward 5, we can answer them offline. I would be happy to respond to the person who's asking that. Um, as it, many people know, you've seen a lot of burglaries that are occurring at the public storage up on uh, up in Ward uh, in Ward Six. Um, we believe um, that a lot of these were done around the same time. However, with public storage, people don't necessarily check their units um, frequently. So a lot of these that you may see come in two weeks later, three weeks later, we think occurred earlier. So it, when you see it. Uh, like we had one, I think, yesterday or today, that didn't necessarily mean that it happened yesterday or today. Uh, we have worked directly with that company there. Uh, their video surveillance was not working. Uh, we've now worked with them. It is now functional. Uh, we also, when I talked about details, uh, we also have details, high uniform patrols in that area. Uh, so we're doing everything we can to, um, uh, to make sure that that does not happen again. But I want to stress to the public, when you see these, it doesn't necessarily, like I think the last one, the last time the person checked the unit was March 1st. Um, so we tried to get with the management company to ensure that they are having the people that are renting their check frequently. And so we, we may discover a few more. We're confident because we have surveillance up now that these aren't occurring um, again and repeatedly, if that answers the question. Um, all right. let's. Go to another one on Zoom. Can you give us a sense of how many questions we have online, just so um, we make sure we balance no, out the time? It's in a web chat, so it's I oh, have to okay, go through okay. and count. That's okay. Thanks. There's not many, though, honestly. Okay. Um, many of the incidents in Ward Five have occurred just over the border of Tacoma Park, specifically Flower Avenue or Piney Branch. Can you go through how police in Tacoma Park and Montgomery Park coordinate? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we we I know we had the the pretty serious incident right outside of the city of the mail mail carrier. 
uh, that was robbed um, uh, during the daytime, which was one of those incidents. So just so you know, um, and I think you mentioned park police, but as I mentioned earlier, not only the park police, but the county police in real time, an incident that happens a block over is gonna be, is gonna be um, broadcast on our air as well. A lot of times they'll come in and help us on incidents that are right over the line and vice versa, we'll assist them with incidents over the line. So uh, there's not a, a strict barrier. So, so there is a barrier for the District of Columbia. That is the only abutting jurisdiction that we cannot go in and assist the District of Columbia unless it is a serious event, a homicide, something to that effect. But Montgomery County, we have an MOU with them that gives us full concurrent jurisdiction in their area, same with them, with us, same with the, uh, the, same with the park police. They have concurrent jurisdiction across the county as well as in Tacoma Park. So we all have that jurisdiction where we can cross those, those, those lines and assist the other officers. That's the same with Prince George's. We don't have an MOU with them, but we have jurisdiction in the state of Maryland. So, um, you know, like I say, it, it's a team effort. Uh, we don't say, okay, well, that just occurred a, a, a block over in Silver Spring. We're not going to respond out. If one of our officers is the closest, we will, go, we will respond out, we will secure the scene, and we will assist the county police and vice versa as they will for us. Any more on? There's just actually one more. Okay. Um, how can we get a speed check on Carol and Garland? Um, I'm not sure what they're referring to a speed check. If they, we, we have um, our speed, we have a, a traffic counter that can, they can put, they can count the speeds of vehicles as well as volumes of vehicles if that's being requested. Um, if they're talking about stop sign technology, meaning uh, like we have speed cameras and we have red light cameras, um, currently in the state of Maryland, stop sign technology is not um, authorized in the state of Maryland. There are two bills, I believe, at the state legislature that will authorize that stop sign technology. Um, we are in support of that. One of our delegates, Delegate Charcutian from District 20, um, put forward one of those bills. I, th I support that technology. Uh, the force multiplier having a, a camera um, out on those locations. So I'm not sure if the, the resident is referring to a camera, meaning a stop sign enforcement camera or a surveillance camera. I'm not sure what the question is. Speed but, cameras. Uh, they we, just wrote. Okay. Just specifically on speed cameras in the city of Tacoma Park. We have exhausted every location that we can place a speed camera in the city of Tacoma Park. We have. We, we can, we, that, you know, pe people request them all the time. We have evaluated um, almost every area in Tacoma Park, and, and we have placed them everywhere we can. The one thing that we are adding, um, and you'll see it in our annual report, is red light cameras. Uh, we recently signed a contract with Conduit. Conduit is the contractor that does our speed, uh, speed camera um, in, enforcement um, uh, program to do red light cameras. And we're gonna put them at several areas throughout the city. That's also gonna be a, false, a force multiplier and assist us with these problematic areas in the city where accidents have been repeated. So we're looking at this technology. I support this technology. Um, I realize that along Flower, there have been a, ongoing problems with stop sign running, with some of the new stop signs. It's on our hotspot area for traffic enforcement. We periodically conduct traffic enforcement but we can't be everywhere at the same time. So I think that these, this automation of having the traffic sign, sign automation is really gonna assist us. Um, if you have specific areas that you have problems, um, Eve Merrill, our patrol commander, she will make sure that she gets the information down to the troops to deploy our resources out accordingly. Can, can you just elaborate for that resident in case they're not able to do that quickly, what you mean when you say you've exhausted all locations where they can be, uh, what, there, you there mean, are, what you specifically mean by that? There Thank are you. certain criteria for space placement of speed cameras. Um, there's sight lines, there's, there's all kinds of different variables. Mm -hmm. We cannot, we, there are no more locations that we could get approved for those criteria in the city of Tacoma Park. And we just did a, a reassessment, I think, a few years ago um, because there were several sites. And people said, well, can I put a speed camera up here? It just it doesn't work that way. You can't just put a speed camera out on Maple Avenue. It just it doesn't work that way. So that, when I say we've exhausted all of the areas, we can put cameras out. And, and just so you know, cameras are not, they're designed to correct behavior. That's what they're designed to do. So when we originally got the speed cameras years ago, we had probably triple the number of offenses that we have now. So it's working. It is working, and that's what we want to do with, with, with stop sign camera technology. That's what we want to do with red light camera technology is to correct behavior, um, and that's what we're hoping to do by adding uh, not only 
the red light cameras that are coming hopefully within the next month or so, but also uh, looking forward to, to stop sign technology if that technology becomes uh, um, lawful in, in the state of Maryland. Thank you. Do you have any more on? No more. One, more, one more online and then we'll go back to the audience. I assume this is Ward 5, I honestly don't know. Um, how can we get a crosswalk sign and pavement markings on Carroll and Garland to cross Carroll? There is a, a, if you go on our website, that's more public works, and there's a, a way in which you can request um, improvements, uh, whether it be sidewalks, whether it be speed bumps, and so on and so forth. Um, is there a way to get that person's contact information and we can follow up? If they can just leave an email, I'll have a staff member follow up with them on the specifics about how to go about doing that. I, I assume, too, we'll get a, I'll get a readout of the chat, yeah, with the names of the people. Is that? Should, yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. I can probably find them, too. All right, we will turn it back over to questions in the audience. Neil, member of the Chief's Advisory Board. <laughs> Welcome. When you report reports of stop signs, are they all verified or just reported? That, that, is, that, that is a really good question. Uh, not all of our shots Can fired calls do we find shell casings or evidence of shots fired. Um, if you look at our community alerts, it will specify whether or not shell casings were found or evidence of shots fired. The majority of them, uh, shell casings and evidence of, 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 of shots fired does not exist. Obviously, there have been some throughout the city, especially over in Ward 3, uh, where we've had shine shot up. We had an incident, a horrific incident, where a bullet went through a kitchen, ended up in a child's bedroom. We had another one where it ended up on a, on a pillow. And a, so, so those are confirmed ones, but not all of them have, you know, a lot of times it might be a backfire. We had one last week that we received the call for shots fired and it was a contact shooting that occurred just across the border in the District of Columbia. So you'll see in our, you'll see in our community alerts specifically that Kathy puts out whether or not we, you know, there was evidence of shell casings found and so on and so forth. I mean, a lot of times we, we get a lot of them that are, especially in your ward, that are coming from Sligo Creek Parkway. A lot of them. So it is, it is thought that Sligo Creek Parkway is, is used for two things, kind of for some drag racing and some speeding, but also uh, for an isolated area to shoot off, um, shoot off rounds. And, and that area in particular echoes to various different neighborhoods. So we'll get them as far away as Maple Avenue or Ward 4 and so on and so forth. Um, so that's something that we're aware of. Um, I'm not aware of any confirmed shell casings found on park property unless Lieutenant Smith is aware of, of last year. I think the only ones that we had confirmed shell casings or confirmed um, were over by Totley Fraser Park, that area, where I think we had two or three incidents where we had, you know, one that was in the middle of the day, which was, you know, very disconcerting considering, you know, the time of day and so on and so forth. But uh, to answer your question, we normally are very specific about whether or not, but we put out all of them. We put out all, all, all of our shots fired calls you'll see come out on our daily and weekly updates. Any other questions in the audience? Uh, we'll go right. Um, my question was, has to do with the statistics. Uh, so I kind of know the answer as far as most of the crime committed in Tacoma Park is not committed by people that are living in Tacoma Park. Mm -hmm. um, do we know if most of the crime among juveniles, is this following the same pattern? Absolutely. Um, when we did our, our data dump for the last five years of, of traffic data, traffic stop data, and arrest data, um, over 70% of, uh, it's actually higher, closer to 80% of the people we arrest are not Tacoma Park residents. And it's the same trend for our juveniles. A lot of our juveniles cross over from Prince George's County of the District of Columbia um, and commit crime. So it's pretty, yeah, it's, it's so, so when, when we talk about addressing our own youth here in the city, and people say, well, why are you doing that when 70, you know, only 20% of the people committing crime, because we need to do our part and if we prevent a crime in Silver Spring or the park system or Prince George's County, we're doing our part. So if everyone participates in this holistic view of how we prevent crime, then, it, then I think we'll, we'll be in a much better position. But to, an, that, to answer your question, the vast majority are not Tacoma Park residents. Um, Ruben, question. Um, <clears throat> I always have a lot of questions, but... <laughs> um, Council members from former or current yeah, never have a lot exactly. of Yeah, I know, exactly. We're <laughs> talking a bunch. Um, one of the things I heard mentioned was uh, getting uh, out of the patrol car into the community and talking to people, particularly business owners, 
for example, and letting them know about things they can do to you know, prevent crime, like you were talking about. Um, and I wondered about uh, Tacoma Park. You haven't talked about whether we have a similar sort of get out into the community. And the reason I say this is um, <clears throat> many years ago, uh, I saw a Tacoma Park uh, police officer handle a situation that I know I would have mishandled um, if it had been me. He was driving in his patrol car, and uh, kids that looked like they were about 13 were hanging out on this corner, and when the patrol car went by, they flipped the officers the bird. And uh, what did the officer do? He, got out, he stopped the car, got out of the car. He didn't say a word about that. He just chatted with these kids. And in a few minutes, they were, wow, you know? They were so... Uh, appreciated that this officer had taken the time to talk to them, introduce himself, talk a little bit about programs like you were saying in the community. He never said a word about the disrespect. Now, if those had been two 20-year-olds, the officer would have done something different. But these were a way to um, educate these kids and make them feel comfortable with the police, which means they'll report crimes if they see one, they're much less likely to do it themselves, et cetera, et cetera. So if you'll talk about what Tacoma Park might be doing, that'd be great. A absolutely, and Ruben, one contact at a time is what I say. The more positive contacts you have, uh, the more it outweighs the negative ones. Um, so that's a, gr that's a great story. Um, you know, I, I will say this, we, are, we, are, we stress to our officers to get out and interact. Uh, we have a Take 30 program where our officers for 30 minutes of a shift go out and they patrol, whether or not on bicycle, whether or not on, on foot. Uh, we specifically went out and bought a bunch of electric bicycles because a lot of times our officers would be out on bicycle and you know they, they'd be away from their car and they couldn't answer calls for service. Uh, these bicycles are extremely fast. So if they're in the crossroads, they can respond to calls for service almost as fast as they can in a car. So we have those. We also have overtime details in the Tacoma Langley Crossroads where officers are required to be out on foot and so on and so forth. So that that, that presence is really important. Uh, we want our officers to get out and, and interact. Um, obviously, there are limitations, and that's why we went out and bought the electric bikes, just because we want that to be a mode of transportation where they can interact with the community. You're a lot more approachable if you're not in that in that you know one ton vehicle. If you're in a, on a bike, or on a horse, we're not going to get horses anytime soon. Just, <laughs> just so whoever advocated for Cana, yeah. Um, so so I, I think that, that all of our agencies uh, understand the importance of, of that and those interactions. Uh, I think we have a question in the back, Maxine. Uh, one is just a, a question, and you can answer it any way you want, and the other is kind of a comment. So I'll give it a question first. We are looking at the imminent arrival of the Purple Line right in that area that you guys keep saying is so rough, which is really close to us. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, there's that excitement about it. I'm not sure when it's going to happen. It changes often. And then it's like, well, how will that impact us? Because now we're going to have a lot of people, a transit center and all that. So put that aside. And the other thing is on the speed cameras because I come from places where the citizens have had them taken down. And not because they didn't want people to stop speeding, because when I really sit and look at it, I go, who? They're everywhere. They're almost predatory. And when I see them, I mean, I have to remember where they are. You know, and some of them, when you're on New Hampshire and you're going downhill towards Sligo Creek and you're gonna make a left on the creek, you can't see them. You can't see the sign that says photo enforced. You can't see the camera. I got a ticket for going 70 miles an hour in a construction zone, and I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't see a sign. It was in the middle of the night, and nobody was there, and I'm going to fight it. They make that really, really, really hard, and I don't even go 70 on the freeway most of the time. But the other thing is, well, why don't you make, if you really want to stop speed, put up signs with blinking lights, you know, slow your car, you know, photo enforcement, slow down. And then when you get past that point, thank you for maintaining a safe speed. I mean, we <laughs> don't incentivize. Maxine, I, I certainly yeah. wish it was that easy. Well, no, but, but, but what I'm getting at is I see it again. And you know who really gets it in the teeth? $40 if you're making X amount of money a year isn't going to take it out of your hide. But they get more and more. And I live in the area where the guys who 
who knows what they're making, but I know they're not making bank at all. That's why they're living in rent control crappy apartments. And it really impacts our really low income. And I'm like, I, I agree. I lived in an area where I was afraid to walk out of my house. Even the cops sped there. I went out in front of a cop car and said, slow down one day. Why not make it, if you want it safe, incentivize it, and let, let us know where cameras are because people will get into habit. You said it's learned and it's all of this. Well, you know, tricking people, and you get another envelope in the mail. Yeah, we we don't, uh, Maxine, just so you know, all, all of our cameras are highly publicized. We, they're on our website. We, we, put the, we put them everywhere, they're, they're and that's purposeful, so people know where they are. They're not easily seen. The signage isn't easily seen. Half the time, you don't even know what the, what the speed limit is, and I'm like, this does not seem fair, and it has a really negative impact on the people who can afford the least to deal with it. I, I, I will say this about that aspect of it. One of the bills that's being introduced for the, speed, for the stop sign technology has that poverty exception and that gra gra uh, that graduated how much you make exception. I don't know if that's going to pass, but they considered that. You just democratize it. And, I mean, what, guess what? You're poor, then you get a break. That's because you're rich. You don't worry I, about it's, it. it, it, it it, it's, it's it, in a perfect world, all that would work. I will tell you just, I, I will speak specifically about our speed camera program, and I'm sure it's consistent in the county police. We are very, very transparent about where they are with signage about uh, alerting drivers where they are. It's on our website. We are very, very transparent. But then, then maybe they should drive the speed limit, and that's what we want them to do. That, that's what we want them to do. So, so our whole point of putting speed cameras out or red light cameras out is they are in locations where we've had accidents. We are trying to avoid vehicle accidents, thus injuries to our residents. That is the whole reason for the program. So it's not about money generation. It's not about that. It's about um, traffic safety, pedestrian safety, and that is the key. Uh, and, I, and I would not condone or support any program that didn't have anything that was not in line with those objectives. See, I think you need to make them that. Uh, that's a good question. So the, the Purple Line construction has had a tremendous impact on Tacoma Park, mainly Ward 6, but also Ward 5. As far as traffic overflow, I, I see Commander Big Bain nodding his head. It's not just Tacoma Park. Uh, we're concerned about that. Um, our elected officials are holding the Purple Line uh, const you know, uh, construction companies accountable and the state accountable for what they're doing and the impact. Uh, Council uh, Mayor Searcy was a council member for Ward 6 previously. Uh, she's been in meetings with them, and I agree with you. It's been up and down. We don't know when it's going to be fixed. It's going to start. It's going to end. So I, I, I feel for the businesses in the crossroads that are impacted. I feel for our residents that are getting this overflow traffic. Um, your ward is in Ward 6. Uh, so it's on the radar, and I don't know if our if Councilmember Hanzak or, or someone else wants to speak on it, but um, Mayor, do you want to touch on it since it's your ward specifically? Um, sure, yes. I completely understand the frustration that folks have. Um, it only takes driving down Piney Branch or University Boulevard to hit a nice large pothole um, to uh, stress how difficult construction has been, not just on vehicles, but also on pedestrians. Um, we've done a number of walkthroughs, um, and so uh, our hope is to continue to do that. Um, the Purple Line uh, contractor has just resumed their community advisory team meetings, um, and those are public meetings where they walk through where they are in the construction process. Um, I've also been working with my colleagues on the council, Council Member Hanzak, um, and Councilmember Small, um, as we try to work to schedule um, new meetings with the new contractors, um, as well as MTA to really walk through um, the areas of the city that are heavily impacted. We've done this before um, to make them aware of the impacts of construction on just daily life and safety um, for residents that are driving as well as um, pedestrian safety as well. Um, so we're looking to reconvene those meetings and have reached out um, to get some of those items set up. First in, in Ward 6, one is being um, set up now for Ward 6, but definitely we can have similar walkthroughs um, with leadership in Ward 5. 
Thank you, Mayor. And if I can just add, um, I have really made it a point to try to get more connected with uh, those working in the Purple Line community engagement uh, side of things and, and get more educated myself. And I'm making a, 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 a sizable effort. If you see me not doing enough and you're in the know, I'm looking at Troy over here. I know is very well connected on Purple Line issues in Ward 5 um, and has been doing that for a long time on our behalf. There aren't a lot of people who have been super active in Ward 5 with respect to the Purple Line. I think that's a fair statement, uh, and we need to be. It's the time. It's part of the reason I ran now, too, because I've lived here for 20 years, and I haven't done enough. Uh, but we, I, I am trying to get really connected and give out information on my weekly updates, my email updates, to let you guys know so that more of us can show up and, and be in the know and figure out what we collectively can do together to think about how it's going to impact us because it's now, it's not, uh, it's not in the future. And in terms of public safety, that gets me to a question, if, if you'll allow me. Um, I have been talking to a lot of people who aren't able to make it tonight or, you know, this is just a difficult time for them. Um, a, a lot of people living on the northern tip of our ward, and we do have you guys here with us from the county and parks, but I'm going to look at the, our county colleagues right now. Um, have said to me that in particular, right up by uh, Flower and Piney, we have a lot of people who are pedestrians in that area. We're gonna see a great increase as Purple Line gets more and more and more active. Um, there are some people who are drinking. Uh, there's a, occasionally, I know you, there, there are probably some drug activity. I spoke at, at length with somebody who said she was too angry to come tonight. Uh, a woman of color who's lived uh, on the other side of Flower, I told those folks they were invited. Um, I don't know if she's online with us tonight, um, but you know it was a really intense conversation in which we talked a lot about what's been going on, and she feels like she's played a key role living right there as long as she has in trying to sort of get rid of some of the drug activity and engage with people. And uh, and we talked about how. There are lots of people who are uh, every day kind of sitting under the bus stop on the, I guess it's on the county side, but now that's sort of Tacoma Park because we purchased the other so sidewalk. Um, but, you know, maybe you could talk to us, both of you, uh, with respect to Tacoma and um, county on, specifically, we have homeless people living up there, but we also have people who are just milling about. I don't know what their status is, but they're almost always there. And we have a lot of Spanish-speaking and other residents who specifically said to me, again, I don't think they're online tonight because they don't speak English comfortably. They said, we just want one simple ask. We want cops on the ground, not in their cars. We want them on foot. There used to be a substation, I was told. I didn't know about that. Uh, and and uh, they, they just said, please, could you just say for us? So I am saying right now for you, please tell us, what could you do to be on foot, boots on the ground, at that corner regularly? And, uh, and it's both county and, and Tacoma, I think. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so um, last year, um, I... Um, so last year, um, in addition to the foot patrols that I put in downtown, um, I trained up ten, ten of, eight or ten of my officers for additional bike patrols, which I put down into the uh, Long Branch, Piney Branch region. Uh, again, it was to, um, like Chief Duval was saying, is to get them out of the car, into the community. Um, we actually find that uh, the officers can ride up on individuals that are using drugs or dealing drugs. and almost undetected and kind of roll up on them pretty fast. So we've been, uh, you know, we started that last spring. Over the winter, clearly we're not on the bikes as much and very, very little at all. But as we move into the next few months, uh, part of uh, my, my rollout for this region for Piney Branch and, and Long Branch is the bike patrols again. Uh, in my opening remarks, I did talk about the engagement with the uh, homeless population. We have a significant Hispanic population uh, that, you know, it was interesting. It was almost, uh, you know, it's like chasing, chasing your tail a little bit. Um, the 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 individuals were. We had some issues with them up at Piney Branch and and Flower at some of the restaurants, uh, specifically late at night and early mornings. Um, and we put a little pressure on them there. We we got them moved out of that that area, but then they went down to the county library. Uh, so we, we end up going down there. The the decision I made really and this was a very short-term decision, was not to run them out of the library because I could deal with them a little easier 
in that area. And I, I worked with them as far as getting a little bit of their, their needs taken care of. Um, I actually worked with uh, Father uh, uh, Brian Jordan with St. Camillus Church. Uh, he speaks Spanish, and I was able to translate uh, and, and speak with the, uh, a large majority of, of the, the guys that are hanging out down there. Um, and I will tell you that the, the interesting thing about that, there's about 10, 10 guys down there, uh, but they are new transplants to the county, and they don't have... Um, they're homeless because they came from like Texas and Arizona and in and, and different locations, um, uh, not in the area. So they don't have family in the area. So that's why they're kind of in that situation. So we're gonna continue to do that. Uh, but additional patrols are, are gonna be done. Um, the, uh, the bike patrols are, are in excess to my normal patrols down there. They're, they're a detail that I run through the spring. And so I, I'm hoping to do that. And then also I, I don't talk about um, our, our plainclothes resources, but um, we do a, a significant am amount of work down in this area uh, as far as narcotic sales is concerned. Um, I clearly can't talk about that, but um, when we talk, in, especially in the, to the public, we talk about uniformed resources, but, um, but I, do, uh, I do know that there's a lot of work being down, done down there, um, not only with my special assignment team, but also uh, centralized narcotic you know, units and gang units that uh, work out of our, our headquarters. And, and I would just echo what Commander McBain said. If there's specific issues, we can talk offline and deploy um, resources. We have our patrol commander here can, can deploy resources to the specific area. Uh, we have a small geographic area, kind of those businesses there, but we're more than willing to to add our, our foot patrols or whatever needs to be done. So just, we can, we can Thank communicate. Thank you, I think, we, I think uh, we'd definitely like to see more cops walking the area or biking. The, um, and I know we, you guys don't have enough bikes, I think. Um, I think it'd be nice if we could see if there's options for more bikes maybe, but um, uh, we, we, we'd like to I, see that. I would no? like to say that we need bikes, but we have no? we have. You have enough bikes? Bike? Oh, okay, okay, I thought I had yeah, heard we, that. But we, we can put a few more in the budget if you'd like. <laughs> no, but, no, uh, no, we're not fluffing happy. that budget if more, we don't more, need it. Uh -uh. More than happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll use them. <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, I mean, I know it's I know it's not easy to have your officers get everywhere they need to go uh, during their shift and their patrol. And so I've tried to stress that to people. But I guess I would say, please, if you can concentrate more in that area. And one of the things that was interesting to me, which I will share with both of you, all of you here, uh, our officers, is I talked to a number of Hispanic ref residents. And you know, Tacoma Park is a one of the only rent stabilized areas. Uh, areas in the county, right? So it means that we have an unusually high concentration of people who are going to be working service industry, difficult jobs that nobody else wants. That means that the people that approach me that are asked, specifically asking for this live predominantly in the central and northern part of our ward, even predominantly probably in the county. Um, please bear that in mind. And uh, I had several people say to me in Spanish, I, uh, I have to walk my wife out to the parking lot to get to her job at two in the morning. At th had three different families, two in the morning start time, three in the morning, four in the morning. And I said, yeah, you're right. I don't know if we're doing like the same level of patrolling at that hour of the night up in this part of the ward. I w it would be very much appreciated, especially near the bus stops and up, up along Flower. Thanks. I, I, I appreciate that and duly yeah. noted and we'll go direct offline. I just, I, I wanna echo what I said earlier. I think we need to connect with that uh, segment of our population so they report crime. Because yeah. a lot of what yeah. we do is driven by occurrences. So if yeah. Ward 5 is 4% yeah. of the crime in the city and it's not being underreported, uh, you know, uh, we're going to allocate resources where we're having yeah. shots fired, robberies, carjackings. So uh, whatever we can do, and we can talk offline, how to best get uh, the segment of our population you're referring to, to report crimes to us. And I, I don't know how that, the, the best to do that, and, and obviously, ideally, it'd be through the official mechanism, or maybe we can develop some type of trust. It seems like you have some type of trust with them, so we at least can get a general idea of stuff that's not being reported, yeah. uh, to get an idea of that. So that's something we can work on. Um, I think we have some questions that have come in via Zoom, as, um, so we'll, we'll transfer it to those. And keep in mind, we have about 24 minutes left. We'll try to get every one of everyone's questions in. We'll go a little bit over if we still have questions. Uh, okay. Regarding the shots fired, could we utilize acoustic gunshot detection security system that detects, records, and locates 
the sound of gunfire and alerts the police. Oh, the technology is out there uh, for a jurisdiction of our size and, and, and no, it really, there'd be no benefit to it. Um, a lot of larger cities have it for triangulation to figure out what block it is, but it's just not, without going into detail, it really is not technology that I think would benefit us here in the city. And I, I see Commander B Bain nodding as well, so. Um, is the purple line Ward 5 specific? We, uh, purple line, any okay. purple line questions yes. are Tacoma yes. Park specific, yes. Silver Spring and, specific. And five and yeah. six in yeah. particular. Um, we're right when the chance. purple line is finished, is there an expectation that crime in the area will increase? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that, that that would be the case. Obviously, we're going to continue to analyze the impact of, of you know, for service delivery of, of, of those type of stations coming into, you know, our jurisdiction. We, uh, you know, we're going to be impacted because we have a main station right there in, in the crossroads. Uh, obviously, we're going to allocate more resources there. So if anything, it may be a, a more of a resource thing for the police department to need additional resources if, you know, if crime increased, but I don't think there's necessarily a cause and effect that the purple line comes in and there's going to be more crime. You've got to understand there's going to be more people, more eyes and ears, and so on and so forth. So I wouldn't say no. I wouldn't be concerned that there's going to be a, a massive increase in crime as the purple line comes in. I, I just don't see that. That's it so far. Okay. Um, do you have any questions? I know you had I, some that you I received. I want to make sure, yeah, especially since we have the county and the, and the parks here, I don't want to waste your time. Um, so a few things that have been brought to my table, uh, I asked one of them about the cross-jurisdictional on the north end, but also um, we, uh, we have had, in, in relation to parks, a few issues that have been brought to my attention. One is, could you speak to dogs off leash? And I'm not going to say pro, con, whatever, what do you do? Uh, tell us what your practice is. When, uh, do, do you purposefully ever turn a blind eye? Do you pay a lot of attention? There, we have people on both sides of the fence, but uh, people are concerned. What's your practice? All right, obviously calls for service are prioritized. We're going to take the more serious calls first, and then we'll deal with some of the less serious calls, such as dogs off leash. In our park system, there's signs everywhere. If you come in the park system with a dog, it's supposed to be on leash. And if you're in the parks and you see a dog that's not on leash and you feel there's a safety issue with that, all, you know, please call and we'll have an officer respond. We get them all the time in terms of calls for service. But again, I would ask that you consider the size of the dog and what the infraction is and what the violation is before we waste a resource on just a dog off lead because a lot of people have different opinions about that okay if it's a huge dog that looks vicious you know and is acting aggressive ob obviously please call we'll take care of that but if we have a chihuahua running around you know that's just coming up to people and they're petting it and that so forth you know uh, I would say really <laughs> I mean don't waste a resource on that but um, that, that's kind of our policy as far as dogs being on leash. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, w I will share that uh, even my very own next door neighbor, who may very well be listening, in <laughs> fact, uh, broke several bones from a dog being off leash that ran under her rollerblades, and it was really quite traumatic. Uh, and also, the postal worker, Sam, who works our neighborhood, who is very dear to many of us because she's been serving us for so long, was bitten by a dog last week and was really very upset about it. It was one of our neighborhood dogs. Um, so, you know, um, I, it, it's a tricky business, right? Uh, it, it's, it, a tricky it's a tricky business. business, but there are some real examples in our very own neighborhoods. So just want people to be aware. And, and like yeah. I said earlier, when in doubt, call and, and we'll come. Thank you. But keep in mind these days, a lot of people that own dogs, they get them trained. They go to places where the dog responds to commands off lead. And sometimes <laughs> that's why they feel comfortable with letting them off lead. Yeah. I mean, I've got a rot water at home. He's well trained. Yeah, I, I put him on a lead if I take him anywhere, but could I take him off and have him respond and not worry about him biting someone? I could, but I have canine experience also. But um, just keep that in mind too. Exactly, but we will come. Exactly. So, in two sides. Out, call. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, 
And let me just see if uh, we have some other questions I want to bring up. Actually, might, might you stand up for just one more second? Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, could you speak a little bit more? We have a trash issue that I mentioned to you. Um, so uh, part of our ward is Essex House, and there's a big patch of green with a little forest, a little bit of creek that runs under maple and then shoots out into the creek there. And back there, uh, we have a regular trash pileup. We also had an incident where someone came out from that space. There's sort of a, a, a dumpster area with a fence, so you can't see behind the area if you're in the Essex House parking lot. Somebody came out from a behind there with a gun at 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning uh, and stole uh, a woman's uh, uh, property at gunpoint, uh, which I'm sure our police uh, is aware of. Anyway, and uh, if you could just speak to kind of what you do in that specific spot and how you police it, how you would propose doing it in the future, et cetera. Thank you. Yes, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things that we considered to be very important is when you come to our parks, no matter whether you're visiting a, a trail that you're just walking on or a park itself to have some sort of event, a, a party, whatever, we want it to be clean, we want it to be beautiful, we want you to have a great experience. So the officers are trained that when they go into a park on regular patrol, if they see a trash dumping, and I mentioned some trash dumpings tonight in our statistics because we had seven we dealt with in the surrounding areas of Tacoma Park, the officer goes in, if they see trash where someone is dumped, what they do is they put in what's called a work order. And that work order is for our maintenance department to come out and clean that trash up. And generally it's done rather quickly because we don't want to leave it there, particularly if there's debris where someone could be injured, you know, a child, excuse me, a child or something comes up there and gets cut on broken glass or something like that. We don't want that to happen. So they will, the maintenance department responds pretty quickly and gets it cleaned up. So my recommendation would be if you see that in one of the parks that you visit, please call Park Police. We'll respond. We'll put in the work order, and it'll get cleaned up. If something happens that doesn't get cleaned up within a reasonable amount of time, please call again. I mean, the maintenance department does a really good job of responding to these calls for service and handling them very quickly. Thank you. And now I have a tough, tougher question uh, for our chief, if that's okay, or anyone else on, on the staff. Um, tougher than trash? <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. Or dogs. Or dogs. Uh, or dogs. Okay. Um, okay, so, so um, we, there's a lot of dialogue in our neighborhood. As I said, we're a very diverse neighborhood. We're living in a national time of a um, lot of stuff going on with people finally acknowledging some of the things that are, are really difficult conversations across race, across police, and everybody else. Uh, I'm sure it puts a lot of pressure on the police department right now in terms of what you're having to live with, and I salute you for doing your jobs, and I really appreciate what you do. Um, I wonder if you could just speak a little bit, uh, Chief Duvall, about your thoughts on traffic stops. Um, we've had some people dialoguing on our listserv and in other spaces, and again, it's part of a larger national dialogue, uh, but about kind of your philosophy on traffic stops, what you are advising. I have had people also say this isn't just about traffic stops, but in terms of patrols, they speculate that you, uh, as the chief, when you came in, have perhaps decided to pull back on uh, such frequent patrols because uh, maybe there are some people who don't want to see the cops as much right around them. Can you, can you speak about those two issues and uh, maybe the broader context, but how you do things here? Thank I, you. I, I would be more than happy to, because I think this is extremely important. Um, what we've done in the last five years is we refocus our traffic enforcement on serious offenses, the fatal five, the serious events that all cause traffic fatalities and traffic injuries and pedestrian injuries. So we've gone away from focusing on pulling traffic at a stop sign where there's never been an accident. If you look at our accidents, and you'll see them in our annual report, and where our traffic stops occur, they are almost a direct overlay. We allocate resources based off of resident complaints, and we allocate resources off of accident data. That's what we do. When I first got here, there was a point system for enforcement. And what that did is it caused officers to go out and make meaningless traffic stops to meet the quota. So they would go sit at fishing holes and pull people over 
for things that had no impact on public safety. So if you, the data speaks for itself. What you'll see over the last five years is a drastic reduction in the number of traffic stops that we have, that we have um, initiated. Um, you will not see a reduction in the accidents. But what we've done is we've focused on serious offenses. So if you look across the board at what we're pulling people over for, it's not a hanging air fresher. It's not these small things that don't make any difference on, on traffic and pedestrian safety. Now, the one thing that I am not an advocate for is completely eliminating officers from pulling traffic for, for things that are in the traffic article. There is a current bill by Council Member Jawando at the county level to eliminate the vast majority of traffic stops um, across the board. The problem with that is if someone's driving at night and they don't have any lights on, do you want an officer to pull them over? Yes, you do. If someone is driving and they have no tail lights out, do you want an officer to pull them over? If someone is driving and they have their car stuffed with so much stuff that they can't even see outside of their car, do you want them to pull them over? Yes. Do you want an officer to pull somebody over for an air freshener? No. So what we've done is we have not eliminated the ability to, 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 for officers to, 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 to initiate those traffic stops. But if we see an officer that has 10, 10 citations all for an obstructed view, that's going to send a red flag up for us, and they're not doing what we want them to do. So to be clear, and I've been misquoted at the county level on multiple occasions of supporting something that I do not. Um, we are all about being respectful. If we pull a traffic stop, it is for, to, for pedestrian safety, traffic safety, et cetera. That's what the nexus should be. An officer should be able to articulate that is the reason that they're pulling somebody over, not because of A, B, C, and D. And I will go back to um, one of the portions of the bill calls for no consent searches at all. No consent searches, period. I, I, now, do I want officers going out and stopping everyone and asking for consent? Absolutely not. But that also can be regulated by how you monitor who's doing what and what they're doing. So I'll give you an example. I'll use the, um, the public storage lot. Okay, we have a burglary there. We see a vehicle leaving there that it doesn't necessarily match the description, but we know that they may be involved. We don't have enough to stop them. So we may find a traffic stop to initiate a stop, to then question them. If we quickly discern that they were not involved, we can release them. That, so I'm not saying to use that as a fishing. So if you sit and you just get consent searches. You stop 10 cars and, you, and your goal is to get a consent search. It's because you have a documented reason to try to figure out if a crime has been committed. So I want to be very, very clear. And to touch on the criminal enforcement, it is the same philosophy. We are not ignoring patrols. We actually are increasing patrols. We, are, we want to be visible. We want people to know we're there, period. So we're not eliminating patrols. What we're doing is we're not focusing on low level before it was legalized marijuana or, or, or offenses that have no nexus, once again, to public safety. If you look at the arrest, our arrests have also gone down significantly in the last five years. But what we arrest people for is burglary, homicide, sex offense, auto theft, serious crimes, not petty crimes that have no impact on the public safety in the city of Tacoma Park. So anyone that thinks that we've uh, stopped patrolling, that is absolutely not true. We are putting officers in problem areas for both traffic enforcement and criminal enforcement without, so, 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 so instead of just mandating you can't do A, B, C, and D and not trusting the officer, like I say, if we have an officer who now every month has 20 traffic stops and they're all for an obstructed view, I'm going to wonder why that's happening. And we're going to ask that question. Why did you do it? And so, so we have checks and balances in place to ensure that does not happen. I invite anyone who's listening to go to our webpage. It has the data that, that verifies all of this. I'm not just saying this. The data backs it up. You will see what we're pulling people over and what we're stopping them for. You will see the correlation between where we're stopping people and accidents. You will see we have a reduction in arrest, but what we're arresting people for are for serious offenses. 
I mean, I cannot stress enough to you how critical it is for us to keep the city safe with also respecting all of our constituents, period, period. So I want to be very clear. My job as chief of police is to keep every one of you safe. I would never sacrifice that for, uh, you know, any type of political correctness. It is just right. It is right. We want people to feel comfortable calling the police. We want to be in places that we need to be, and we're doing that. So I, I don't know if that was clear enough. Um, I'd be more than happy to, when we, put, when we put the information out, then this video is going to be put out publicly. The PowerPoint's going to be put out publicly. I will put a direct link to that data dump that we did, and you will be able to see. The num I, if, I, if I sat up here and said we're doing ABC and the numbers said something different, hold me accountable. The numbers, the numbers will, 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 uh, will definitely show exactly what we're doing. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate that candid now, answer. I, I get very pat. I'm, I, I don't mean to get passionate about this, but, but I, the thing I want more than anything is every interaction we have with our residents to be respectful. Um, you know, we're, I was looking at the annual report and, and, you know, our use of force. So we've had over 10,000 contacts. 10,000 contacts last year. And of those 10,000 contacts, we used force 24 times. And I think 16 of those were show of force. That is less than a quarter of a percent of all of our contacts resulted in the use of force. Same thing with complaints. We had six complaints last year. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. In 10, over 10,000, 10,576 calls for service. Six, that's less than half or quarter of a percent. Those show that what we're doing is right. We've hired the right people. We've trained them in the way that we, that we expect. People are here because they want to be here. They don't want to be pressured to do meaningless. Officers don't want to be pressured to do meaningless traffic stops. We've all been there when you got to do this quota system and you got to get your numbers in and you're, you're, you're pulling somebody over for no reason. You want to make sure that what you're doing has an impact, whether or not it's making a criminal arrest or whether it's making a traffic stop, et cetera. So I, I can't say enough. And, and, and like I say, don't take my word for it. <laughs> Review the data. Thank you very much. All right, sorry. Go off on a tangent. <laughs> And I know we're getting to time, but I do want people to hear, because I know there are people who haven't heard, too, and it's going to mean you talking again for a sec. It's just could you tell us a little bit about the plans that you've got with the city about mental health resourcing? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Right now, we uh, through our American Rescue Act plan funds, uh, we have $600,000 allotted for what was going to be a, a pilot program here th uh, through uh, Montgomery County uh, Department of Health and Human Services to have two counselors embedded here in the city of Tacoma Park Police Department. Uh, we're still working through the logistics with uh, DHHS. We're going to be taking an MOU be before the, the city council here shortly for your review uh, so you're aware of how, how the program works. But for the sake of time, basically what we would have is we would have our own counselors over a two-year pilot that would work through DHS uh, that would respond for calls for service specifically here in Tacoma Park. What we are going to do in Tacoma Park, and I believe that they're doing this in a pilot in other area of the county, is to try to see how many calls can be diverted to a non-co-responder model. For right now, the majority of calls are a police officer and a clinician respond out to a call for service. So what we're trying to do with, with our pilot is see how many calls can be diverted to a single source where it's a clinician can handle the call as opposed to a police officer and clinician. What we're also doing and is being done at the county level and instead of triaging, so normally time we'll go out to these calls, um, someone's a danger to themselves or others, we'll commit them, they'll spend time being reviewed and they'll be right back out. There's no follow-up, there's no making sure you have a caseworker, similar to what Gigi does with our victims and witnesses where she'll hold their hand through the process. Now what we envision these counselors doing is, is connecting with our residents in Tacoma Park that are, that are having mental health issues and not only going through that process of, of going through if they need to be committed, committing them, but also following up with the services once they get out so they do not continually be 
uh, through the system, and that's one thing that, that we're lacking. I will say this, that a, a lot of our, most of our, majority of our officers have gone through the advanced crisis intervention training. We have seen the success of that. That's a great program that Montgomery County Police puts on. Um, I, there have been numerous examples of how our officers have handled people in crisis. Last year, we probably had 10 of them, where because of the de-escalation skills that were learned and utilized by our officers, these situations were resolved in a, in a, in a the, the lowest level needed, where that person felt comfortable with the service we provided and they trusted their officers, and that's where we want to get. But eventually, um, the goal is to have, we, we are a small municipality. We don't have a health and human services. So ideally, uh, when, we, when we initially started this program, the county had not amped up their crisis intervention team. They now have. They have it significantly increased the number of clinicians. Um, so we're comfortable that after that two-year period, the services are going to be provided through the Department of Health and Human Services. And they are also, the county police and us, are also gravitating to where that, that trying to divert as many of the mental health calls to a non-co-responder model as possible. So we're hoping that our pilot program here will be able to be a model that might be able to utilize elsewhere if they're doing another pilot throughout the county. Um, but I can't tell you enough how critical these services are in our city and our county. We know the people in this city who are in mental health crisis, and they are continually going through the cycle because they're not getting the help. I, I, for the, I know we're getting close to nine, but I'll just say the county is also expanding their services past that triage point where there'll be a large facility in the outlying years up in Clarksburg where people can have long-term help. I think it's a critical component. Uh, there'll be more information about our program uh, when we go before the council. You'll be able to see the nuts and bolts of what the program entails. Thank you and for, for those sharing. of you, I know there was some concern. It's being managed through the city manager's office, not through the police department. To be clear, the police department is going to be heavily involved in it as well as other entities within the city, but it's going to be managed through the city manager's office. So. We're Sounds pushing like nine, resources. but I want to open it up. To, uh, if you have any more questions, or we can, if the audience has more questions. Were you going to share any uh, resources and follow-ups? If people would like to be more directly connected to police alerts and police resourcing, like the Police Academy, yeah, can you share I, a few I thoughts? Will, uh, uh, the famous oh. Kathy Plevy, I will turn it over to her to, to, uh, to tout her programs. Um, I say it, and I say it all the time. Kathy is, works 24-7 on getting information out on a daily basis in our crime alerts, but also we've expanded. We heard you. We heard you when you when you ask for weekly reports. So we now are putting out weekly reports by ward. When we put our daily reports out, it also mentions the ward in which um, in which the uh, uh, event occurred. So I'm going to turn it over to Kathy to plug her programs. Okay, I'm looking for the now. I don't think this is on. Um, but we also run a community academy for 12 weeks. It usually starts in March and goes until the end of May. And we touch on all different areas of the police department and teach you. We have a really full class this year. We have 16 students, which is really large. Um, but we also do 12 weeks and talk about all the different. We have officers and civilians come in and talk about all the various things they do in the police department. And uh, we go on lots of really cool field trips. Um, it's been, and I think we've had it done for eight years now, Ron. Ron's my partner in that. Yeah, so it's, it's been going for a while, and it's very, it's, it's a really great course. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, but this comes up a lot, and I want to make it correct. I was in the first Tacoma Park Police Department Citizen Police Academy with Kathy Porter, who was then mayor. So it's more than 20 years ago was the first class. Oh, no, I appreciate that. I mean, for me, I, I've, been, I've been teaching it. I've only, I think I've been here 15 years, but I've only done maybe eight years of it. But I, I know it has a, a longer history than that. Definitely. Thank you. Um, but yeah, and as the chief said, we, we now put out a weekly report, too. Um, not just the things you get daily, where usually I just put out an arrest or um, a theft from auto or the, the public storage, but these also talk about larceny thefts from like the Walgreens and the 7-Elevens and um, the lower, not, I don't want to say not important, but they don't usually go out daily, so they're, they're caught up in the weekly, but you can catch up on those. 
Yeah, and, and there's also uh, on our website where you can go back and if say, well, I thought something happened in September, you can go back and look at previous, previous alerts as well. Uh, we'll do one more brief <laughs> question and then I'll turn it over to um, Councilmember Hanzak to finish up. Maxine? Yeah, uh, I just want to shout out to Kathy. Maxine, just give it one one second for the mic so they can catch you. Catch it on Zoom. Especially if you're giving a shout out for us, we wanted to make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure it goes out. I get those um, reports in the email like I used to. I don't know what happened, but um, how many computers have I gone through? But um, I just got to shout this out because I was really I thought it was damn cool. Somebody lost a pet and and Kathy posted it, so it, everybody in the town knew. And I have a special issue with you know what happens to missing pets, but that was very cool. Oh, and I, I agree think with that's you. I have a special place for pets, too. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that was something, you know, we're we always we never criticizing knew. our police, but <laughs> look, our, our four-leggeds are important to people. And that said, bring the dogs back, because I was buds with Diesel. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what I you said. I was really What, what did you say, Maxine? I, could, I didn't hear bring it. <laughs> I'm joking. And I, if I, you I, get a horse, which I don't, Unsupport. I will come in room and uh, uh, take uh, care of that horse. We we're gonna let it graze in your backyard. How you? Okay. I got enough room back there. I think I like animals and policing because they're ambassadors, and people don't mess with an officer on a horse. You know, um, I've wondered, most of the time. I, well, I wouldn't mess with an officer on a horse. Probably not smart. No, I might throw him off it and take his horse, but that's another story. Um, I wonder about the programs that I've seen around. I mean, anything from the Guardian Angels, which that's probably, you know, the Orange Jackets, the Explorers. I, my neighbor, three doors down, is te texting me and emailing me, can I get you a ring camera for your house? Can I take you and get you a gun? I have been mugged before, seriously. It was scary. If I'd had a weapon, I would have killed the guy. It was that scary. It happened at the Metro. But then everybody said, get a stun gun, get a, a, a taser. And I'm like, I don't know how to use that stuff. And I wouldn't even know how to begin, you know, a gun. That's something I would be afraid in my hands, to be quite honest. I'm a little too hot for it. Yeah, well, we're, we're, not, we're not encouraging our no, residents to get on. No, but I wonder about, you know, self-defense classes. I wonder about things. It isn't necessarily that, you know, you can use them or you'll need them, but it empowers people personally and I, I don't know about explorer programs for young people. I don't know about, you know, other things. How can we, without being too heavy handed and turning our town into a police state, be more involved? Because it's really unrealistic to ask a small force, you know, to do every, we're all eyes and ears. Yeah, that, so that, everybody sees what's going on in their hood. That's a real, that's a really good question. I mean, there, there's been some talk to have, to revamp some of our, um, our neighborhood uh, watch groups, um, and we've had several groups approach us about that. Obviously, we, we want to make sure that there's um, you know there a little bit of concerns about people being vigilantes, but we're, we're talking through, through some groups, and more information will come out about that. And I'll touch real quickly, uh, prior to the pandemic, we had a police explorers program. We're looking at bringing that back as well, and some of our other programs that went by the wayside kind of when we when the pandemic happened. So uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna turn it over to Council Member Hanzak to, uh, to say a few final words, because um, we are pushing, we are- Yes, we're over time, and I want people to respect your time. So three quick things. One is uh, thank you for closing on that note about Neighborhood Watch and Police Explorers. People I had, some people had hoped, I'm sorry we didn't get to that, but uh, to talk about actionable next steps. Uh, we, the chief and I had discussed this. We decided that is really something that we need to do to be mindful of our county and our parks department's time and do that as a Ward 5 community and then we can bring those ideas back to our police department. So I, I will try to organize if folks wanna step up and help me a Zoom meeting at least so we can get catch more people in the neighborhood as a follow up to this meeting within the next month or two to talk about next steps and also to talk about broader public safety issues. That was a question that came up uh, among my constituents saying, wait a second, I thought we were gonna sort of open it bigger than just the police, but we will talk about that as a Ward 5 community. There will also be some discussion around um, emergency preparedness coming up, I think with council maybe. Um, 
And then finally, if you're interested in neighborhood updates about Ward 5, please sign up for my email updates and come up, make sure your name is on the list. And if you're online, you can email me at C-A-R-A-H at TacomaParkMD.gov and I will add you to my list. You can find me on Google if you didn't catch that. All right. Well, thank you very much to the allied agencies that have joined us, and thank you to all of you all. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email them to Kathy, and she'll get them to all of us. So thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Oh, I feel Thank you.